Hello friends, it's Mike DeMeo, back for another nightly Dhamma discussion. You know, I have a friend in Virginia who is, for this, you know, current period of time, he is not on social media. He is not on the internet much. We've spoken over the phone a few times, but for the most part, he has decided to clock off of social media for a while. He's a Dhamma practitioner, too, and he has decided to focus on his practice and be alone for a while. He said for an entire year he's going to not be on social media and spend time focusing on his practice. And this is something that I wanted to talk about today. This is a very important topic, I believed. Um, excuse me, I believe this is a very important topic to um, speak about, which is the selflessness of focusing on yourself. These are words that we practically never hear in our society, is focus on yourself, or it's good to focus on yourself. From a very young age, we are encouraged by society to be involved in the world, to be involved in things like political activism, to be politically active, um, to follow the rest of the crowd, to do whatever the crowd is doing, to believe in what everyone else believes in, and to not think for ourselves and to do whatever it takes to fit in and be like the rest of the herd. And more importantly, we are encouraged not only by society but, our, but by our own self-view as well. Self-view being the self-cherishing I or ego. We are encouraged not only by society, but by our own self-view to prove ourselves to everyone, to prove to everyone that our way of thinking is the only right way of thinking. You'll see this quite often, you know, practically everywhere you look. I mean, you know, social media is a great place to observe this you know, you'll see people on forums, on Facebook and Twitter and other places in social media, debating each other about which political party is better, which political candidate is better. You know, um, so-and-so is a fascist, so-and-so is a communist, this and that. You'll see these kinds of political debates. You'll see people saying, well, I don't like the way you dressed today, you look ugly today, like on Instagram and other places, you know, on social media, you'll, you'll see this a lot, you know, you'll see people saying things like, you know, you look ugly today, or, you know, your hair looks disgusting and messy, you know, really awful things. You see this a lot on social media. And, you know, social media being not personal, meaning not in public, not face-to-face, -face, people feel more inclined to say and do these things to other people, uh, to get into debates, to argue with people, to cling to their views, as the Buddha would say, uh, and to engage in the never-ending or seemingly never-ending act of needing to prove one's self to the world and needing to prove that one's way of thinking is the only right way of thinking. Now, people, well, I don't want to say people, but the Buddha had a different approach to the world in regards to what we're talking about. You know, the Buddha 
despite having criticized the caste system in Hinduism as, you know, being incorrect, the Buddha also was not contrary to popular belief an activist. The Buddha had no desire to be involved in worldly affairs like political activism or the ways of the world. The Buddha's only interest was putting an end to suffering and teaching others how to put an end to suffering. That was his only concern in his life, was putting an end to suffering and teaching others how to put an end to their suffering. And so the Buddha knew and taught that this requires removing yourself from worldly affairs and taking the time to focus on yourself. This does not mean selfishness, contrary to popular belief. You know, in our society nowadays, we're told that if we focus on ourselves, we're selfish. We don't care about the suffering of others. You know, get involved in that protest. Um, you know, fight for justice. Do what's right, you know. Otherwise, you're racist, you're sexist, you're fascist, you're, you know, you're a bad person. We're oftentimes told this in our society especially nowadays with the whole political correctness movement and, you know, the push for equality and equal rights. And again, you know, this is not me saying that there is no truth to what these people are saying about injustice. There is plenty of injustice in the world. They are correct about that. However, What you see a lot of times from these people, and this is something that I noticed when I was younger, and this is part of the reason why Buddhism resonated with me so strongly, is because from a very young age, I always believed in something that the Buddha would call blamelessness. And this means finding a way to live without harming other living beings. And I always believed in this since I was very young, you know, from a very young age. I always believed in blamelessness. I always believed that one should not be a hypocrite. And if one truly believes in peace and justice and truth, then one needs to represent those things. One needs to become the change they seek. And... This is something that I did not witness enough of, or practically at all, I should say. When I was growing up, I was quite politically active. You know, I was very interested in political activism and politics and the government and what was going on in our country. Um, I'm from the United States. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, being in the United States, we have a very politically active culture. And uh, for, uh, you know, when I was younger, I was, I was quite politically active. I would watch the news a lot and I would pay attention to what was going on with politics and the government and, you know, societal problems and whatnot. And I always believed in what the rest of my generation was saying. My generation is quite progressive and, you know, is pushing for social justice and equal rights and, you know, whatnot. And I always agreed with what they were saying. You know, from the bottom of my heart, I always knew that they had a point to what they were saying about injustice being wrong and, you know, about humans all deserving to be treated equally, living beings in general, not just humans, animals too, all living beings being, you know, uh, worthy or deserving of being treated equally. I always agreed with these values, but I did not witness the so-called compassion or empathy that these people were talking about. I did not witness these values in them. They would talk about compassion and empathy 
And they would talk about how everyone needs to be compassionate and empathetic, but they themselves were not being compassionate and empathetic. They represented the very enemies that they spoke of. And the reason this bothered me so much, even when I was younger, I was wise enough to be bothered by this. And the reason it bothered me so much is because, sure, I mean, you know, these people were right about what they were saying. They had a point. It's just that if you are talking about being the change in the country or the society, in the world, if you are talking about changing the world, then you need to represent those values. You need to be the change you seek in the world. If you want compassion and empathy in the world, then you need to be compassionate and empathetic towards all living beings, even if they're your enemy, even if they're the most horrible person in the world who does the most horrible things. You need to be compassionate and empathetic towards those people. No matter how much wrong they have done. I always believed in this from a very young age. And this is, again, one of the reasons why Buddhism resonated with me so much. Is because this is what the Buddha believed in. Blamelessness. Meaning, if I say that I believe in compassion and empathy... I need to represent that compassion and empathy myself. I need to change myself so that the world can be a better place. And so we take a look at social media. We're, on, we're very active on social media nowadays, we just as humans in general, and we see this stuff all the time where people are debating each other, Cursing at each other, saying mean, nasty things to each other on social media, criticizing someone's, you know, looks or the way they dressed or, you know, what, um, you know, politician or candidate they supported in the election, you know, and, you know, telling them that they're an awful fascist or horrible person or, you know, telling people to go back to their country, um, as if they don't belong here, you know, we see this all the time on social media. We see this lack of compassion and empathy from so many people. And this comes from self-view, which the Buddha talked about a lot. You know, self-view, again, being the self-cherishing I or ego which convinces us that we always need to be right, that we always are right. We're always right, and we need to prove to everyone that we're always right. We're never wrong for anything. That is what self-view tells each and every one of us. It tells us that we are never wrong for anything we do. It could be the most horrible, immoral thing such as killing another living being, purposely taking the life of another living being, and our self-view would tell us that we were justified in doing that. And I see that so often in, for example, politics and, you know, fighting for political power and whatnot. When people are fighting for political power, they will do the most horrible things to the other side to people who do not agree with them and they will justify their actions as being necessary for whatever goals they are seeking to carry out or realize and this is all tying back into my discussion here about focusing on yourself and why focusing on yourself is actually the the ultimate act of selflessness 
Focusing on yourself is not just selfless, it's the ultimate act of selflessness. And the reason being is because when you remove this idea of self from you, you are able, when you remove this idea of self from your own mind, you are able to empathize with other people, with other living beings, whether human or animal. You are able to empathize with other living beings who are suffering, who are grieving and in despair. And you are able to empathize with even the worst of your enemies, even the worst of people in the world who do the most horrible, immoral things. You are able to empathize with those people because now you understand through the teachings of the Buddha and through removing self-view from your own mind, you now understand from eliminating self-view that these people are suffering, horrible as they may be, or worst of an enemy as they may be, they are suffering, and that is why they are doing these awful things to you and to others. And this takes time and effort. This is why we need to clock off of social media sometimes. This is why we need to observe our actions on social media consistently, every day, not just part-time, but consistently, every day. We need to observe our own minds and observe our need, our, our incessant, subtle, it's sometimes very subtle, but we need to observe even the most subtle need to be right over someone. We need to observe the even the most subtle need to be right over someone else. And when we start needing to prove that we're right, it's not that we may not be right, we may very well be right, but when we start needing to prove to the world and to prove to other people that we are right and that we are always right, that is when we start doing things like killing and stealing and destroying the lives of other living beings and doing wicked and immoral things. We You know, I have been, I, I can't tell you how many bridges have been burned by people in the world from just needing to defeat the other side, from needing to defeat the other person. I cannot describe to you how many bridges people have burned by needing to prove that they're right all the time. You know, bridges burned with their friends their family, their neighbors, their society. I cannot tell you how many bridges people have burned with me and bridges that I've burned with other people. All from self-view and needing to be right all the time, from clinging to views and needing to prove that one is right all the time. You know, when I was younger, I grew up in the church. I was a Christian growing up. Um, I grew up in a Christian household. And, you know, we had youth leaders and mentors. And, you know, they always talked about these things like being, you know, Jesus loves. And, you know, we should love people like Jesus. But... I observed on more than one occasion that they were not being loving themselves, that they needed to show everyone the correct way of living, and they needed to prove to everyone the correct way of living. My brother one time said something that 
you know, again, I'm not, well, you know, I, I don't want to say that he did the right thing, but he said something, you know, as silly 16 or 17 year olds say, you know, we don't really think about our words and our actions back then. And one of the youth leaders at the church lost his, there's actually, this is not just a youth, he wasn't just a youth leader, he was the pastor and he lost his temper at my brother. And I witnessed this in front of my own eyes and it disturbed me greatly. The other youth leader, because we were in like a youth group and the pastor was one of the leaders and there was another youth leader at the church in the group and she wasn't, you know, a pastor or anything like that, but she was a devout Christian devotee going to the church and being involved in the youth group and you know she is a good friend of my mother and um, I considered her a very good friend too until one day when she I did again I did a silly teenage post you know teenagers are silly we um, you know when we're teenagers we don't really think about our actions all the time but she responded to one of my posts she sent a you know a private message to me and she told me that she was like disgusted and disappointed by my post and it was a very confrontational message and i felt very attacked you know 17 year old 16 year old i was around that age you know 17 or 16 and, you know, I hadn't become a Buddhist yet, and, you know, um, I, of course, had a lot of self-view back then, and understandably, I was very upset. I was very hurt and feeling betrayed by this person who I considered a friend, uh, not just a friend of me, but of my entire family, as she is a friend of my mom, you know. Of course, I've completely forgiven her uh, since that time, you know, since I've become a Buddhist, but um, the message remains the same. You know, I still, to this day, disagree, strongly disagree with what she did. Not that I was right or anything, but she did not approach me in the proper way. She did not tell me how to do the right thing in the right way. She essentially belittled me. That's what it felt like, that I was being belittled. And that I was being told that um, I was being confronted. That's, that's what it felt like. Rather than, you know, love, it felt like confrontation. She... You know, again, I may have been totally wrong. I probably was totally wrong for this Facebook post. Um, but again, I was a silly 16, 17-year-old who didn't think about his actions. You know, I was a crazy kid back then, as a lot of, you know, teenagers are. Um, and I felt hurt and betrayed that, you know, this youth leader who I considered a role model... Um, said these things like she was disgusted with me and, you know, was confronting me. It, it was very sad and disheartening to me, and I felt betrayed by this person. And, um, you know, I've had other incidents, you know, where I've had really good friends, I mean, very, very good friends, and they've you know, um, been my friends until they needed to prove that they were right over me. You know, I've had very good friends who I am no longer friends with. You know, I, I've had several friends who I am no longer friends with. Um, I can't count probably more than, probably more friends than the, um, you know, first five fingers on my, um, on my, on my hands, you know, uh, several, I've had several friends who, um, 
were my friends until they needed to prove that they were right over me. And this is not that I have any issues with them or that they, um, you know, are all horrible, bad people. I, I don't have issues with these, these people. It's, it's, you know, um, maybe their opinions are different, you know, and that's okay. Everyone has different opinions. It's just that they needed to prove that they were right over me. And they didn't want to be my friend unless they could make me see that I was wrong. That is the main thing here, is that they did not want to be my friend unless they could make me see the error in my ways. And, you know, I've done that in the past too, where I, you know, have quote-unquote canceled people. You know, we have this thing called cancel culture nowadays. And, uh, and, you know, I've, I've done that in the past, too, you know, where I've been ignorant and I've canceled people over literally a disagreement in views or opinions. And this is um, something that a lot of people struggle with is not needing to be right all the time. And this is why, again... We need to take the time to focus on ourselves and remove the self-view from our own minds and start viewing even the worst of our enemies with compassion and empathy. Viewing them as fellow beings who are suffering in this realm of samsara along with us fellow beings who are suffering and just trying to find their way out of suffering. That is what we need to start seeing these people, even the worst of our enemies, as fellow beings who are suffering in this realm of samsara. And this is something that can only be done by focusing on ourselves. It is not selfish to want to give up trying to control or oppress and make people see the error in their ways all the time. It, it is not selfish to want to give those things up, to not want to control, oppress, or uh, correct people all the time or confront people all the time. This is not me saying that you should never correct anyone. I mean, the Buddha corrected his disciples, you know, on several occasions. Um, but here is the thing about it. The Buddha knew how to correct people, how to admonish people. And this is something that my teacher, uh, Robert Rhine, uh, I would say has been very good at with me and other people in our group, especially me, you know, because I'm young and I'm still developing on this Dhamma path, you know. Um, he, Robert, has, has been very wise and discerning about correcting me and about knowing when to correct me. And he does a great job of doing it too. I always appreciate Robert's advice, you know. And he knows exactly when to say what needs to be said. So if I say something that is out of, I guess, out of line or not um, the right thing to say, or, you know, when... Uh, this is a great thing that he's done in the past before... You know, and it's really forced me to confront my own self-view and my own need for attention or my own need for approval, I should say. Because that's something that I've struggled with my whole life until recently is the need for attention and approval. It's, it's a very, very strong aspect of self-view. And I'll get into that in a, another Dhamma talk later. Um, but Robert, you know, has always, when I'm having these episodes of, you know, doubting myself or needing someone to approve of me or to pay attention to me. He always responds in this, like, it's almost like he can tell. And he responds in this very, you know, wise and compassionate way. And he tries to help me. 
and you know he says all the right things and you know he's just very wise and compassionate about it and um he always says it in a very nice manner you know and nice you know uh tone and so um it's funny because that has actually made me to confront my own insecurities and my own self-view it's um, ironic, you know, somebody, you know, who, who is responding to me in a nice way rather than a confrontational way is the one who's helping me to see that I have these problems, you know, and, um, it, it's, it, the reason it's happened because again, he's, you know, speaking to me in a nice tone, in a nice manner and, and a nice, in a, in a nice way. And so it makes me kind of look at myself like, I'm an idiot, not in like a really, really critical way, but like, oh, you know, that was, that was silly. You know, you didn't need to say that. You didn't need to make a scene about that. And, you know, this and that, like, oh, that was, that was really silly. Like, see, the only one who lost, um, his composure was you. You're the only one who lost any composure here. Um, and Robert, you know, keeping his composure has been able to, I think really, you know, get at me in that way and making me see how I'm just the only one losing my composure. Uh, so it's, 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 it's great. I love it. Um, and that is something again, that the Buddha, I would, uh, we're, let's, let's talk about the Buddha again. That is something the Buddha did many, many times with his disciples is he would correct them but he would be wise about it. He would know when to do it. And that's another thing about Robert is Robert knows exactly when to correct me or say something to me or admonish me. He knows exactly when to do it. He always does it at the right time. And that is what the Buddha did with his disciples is when he corrected them, he would do it at the right time and he would do it in the right way. Always, always at the right time, always in the right way, always um, you know, not always, you know, and sometimes the Buddha would be stern and strict when he needed to be, but he would know how to do it without being rude and confrontational. He, he wouldn't be rude or confrontational about it. He would just be stern and strict. And he would, you know, when, when his disciples really messed up and did the wrong thing, he'd be like, look, you know, that, that was silly. Like you shouldn't have done that. That was, that was wrong of you. Um, and, um, you know, it's, it's, he always did it, the Buddha, you can tell, always did it out of compassion for his disciples. Uh, and that is how I feel about Robert, is that when he corrects me and other people, or admonishes me and other people, he does it out of compassion, or out of a genuine desire to see us grow on this Dhamma path. Um, so, that is what I mean, is we need to be aware of it again it's not wrong to correct people when they do the wrong thing it's about knowing when to do it and how to do it we correct people we as humans correct people for literally everything for anything that we disagree with that we personally disagree with we will correct somebody for it on social media again instagram for example, like on Instagram, oh, your dress is ugly today. Oh, you know, you should have worn nicer jeans today. You know, we correct people. For, we get offended by literally everything. And we correct people for literally everything. And we do it in a really mean way, in a confrontational way, too. And so, you know, um, we need to understand when to correct someone, when the right time to do it is, and how to do it. Not everyone needs to be corrected for everything. Excuse me, not everything needs to be corrected. You know, not every, not everything that someone says needs to be corrected. And like I said, I've, I've had numerous friends who are no longer my friends, not because I had any issues with them. I still don't have any issues with them. It's just that they needed to be right. And the only way that we could continue our friendship is if 
they could make me see the error in my ways. And I've done that myself to people in the past as well. I'm not perfect. I've done that too. Um, where I needed to get this person to see the error in their ways or cancel them. Uh, you know, we nowadays with the politically correct or political correctness movement, uh, the cancel culture, we have taken wrong speech and self view and blameworthiness to a whole new level to extraordinary heights um, w with this uh, political correctness movement, this cancel culture on social media. We, <clears throat> we have, with, with these things, we have taken blameworthiness and selfishness to a whole new level to extraordinary heights, as I said. And it's time, I think, for us as humans to really step back and evaluate what compassion truly is. Is compassion needing to be right all the time? Needing to prove that you're right all the time? Is that compassion starting arguments and debates with other people all the time so that you can prove that you are right over this person? Or is compassion taking a step back and focusing on yourself for a while like my friend in Virginia is doing uh, as, um, you know, I think we should all be doing and, you know, taking a step back and focusing on yourself and trying to develop your wisdom and trying to change your ways so that you can be more blameless and so that you can show other people how we can speak, uh, so you can show other people how we can speak kind words to each other kind and compassionate words, how we can say kind and compassionate things to each other, and how we can all live in harmony as living beings. That is, is my idea of compassion, is, and I hope, you know, with the excesses of political correctness and the cancel culture, and, you know, the rise in, um, you know, uh, extremism and nationalism and all these other things in the world. I hope, for once, people, no matter who they are and what their views or opinions about the world are, I hope people will stop being so worldly all the time, meaning needing to be involved in everyone else's business all the time and needing to tell everyone what is right and wrong all the time. I hope people will step back and evaluate their own minds and evaluate what compassion truly looks like and see how when we take a step back and when we start accepting that not everyone can be like us or have the same opinions as us. We can stop needing to prove that we're right all the time and we can actually have real peace and harmony, at least a little more peace and harmony in the world. We can do those things when we start stepping back from social media and from the debates and from the arguments and from this belief that I need to be right all the time and start understanding that peace is better than being right all the time and understanding that 
if we want to see a more compassionate and empathetic world, we need to represent that compassion and empathy. We need to become the change we seek in the world. We need to start valuing blamelessness rather than blameworthiness. So that is the crux of what I am speaking about tonight. And I want to thank everyone for joining me for this Dhamma discussion. And I hope to see you all next time. Thank you.